on this edition of In the Life. Gay filmmakers bring race and ethnicity into focus. Aid service groups seek new strategies for survival. Plus, a teenage dropout returns to school as president of San Francisco's Board of Education. That's what it's all about, education. I'm serious. And in the nation's capital, a lesbian artist gets a major retrospective of her work. All this and more on this edition of In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Leppin, Peter Zimmer and Jim Stepp, the Arch and Bruce Brown Foundation, the Collingwood Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice. The Gay Network, gay.com, and the annual support of In The Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life, America's gay and lesbian cultural news magazine. Hi, I'm Katherine Linton. In the early decades of the 20th century, Europe, and Paris in particular, was the center of a vibrant artistic and literary community. Among the writers, intellectuals, and self-styled bohemians who gathered to discuss their work or the issues of the day were a number of gay men and lesbians. Two of the most famous, of course, were Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas, but another American expatriate, a painter named Romaine Brooks, also gained recognition, mostly because of her penetrating portraits of women who were members of this so-called Salon Society. On this episode of In the Life, we'll tour a major retrospective of the work of Romaine Brooks, the first to examine how her sexuality influenced her art. The term political activist... Correspondent images. Jonathan Capehart profiles Juanita Owens, a high school dropout who's a respected educator, activist, and now political candidate. And Darius Dahaz introduces us to a special group of gay men and lesbians who are exploring their sexual identity. Developmental disability is a broad category that can include people who are mentally retarded. The number one thing all the group members say that they want is to meet other people, possibly have a relationship, have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. But first, a report on the new direction being taken by two long-established AIDS service organizations. With recent medical advances, people with HIV and AIDS are living longer and better lives. This has led to the belief that the AIDS crisis is over, and as a result, contributions to AIDS service organizations are down. Between 1997 and 1999, for example, large grants by foundations decreased by more than 20 percent. In light of this, some groups are re-evaluating their mission and the way they raise money. Mason Essif has the story. In 1988, Carla Gorell was a newly ordained Presbyterian minister at this Washington church. It was here she started a service to feed people sick with AIDS. That's partly what people of faith are called to do is to meet human needs. That's what Jesus did. Using the small kitchen in the church's basement, Food and Friends got its start. At the time, organizations such as Meals on Wheels refused to reach out to AIDS patients. They were very honest with me. They said, we're afraid our volunteers would, re would, would be afraid to have contact with people with AIDS. With only limited space but boundless determination, the staff and volunteers of Food and Friends started feeding those unable to feed themselves. Their goal was clear. We probably saw ourselves as a temporary solution until um, the hoped for cure for AIDS would be discovered and AIDS would go away and people would no longer be dying of AIDS. Hey, Max Lawton. Hi, Max Lawton has been a client of Food and Friends since he was diagnosed with AIDS in 1992. Well, I can't say anything bad about Food and Friends because they've been both to me all these years. Uh, they've been friends and they've also provided me with a lot of food. Uh, they've seen me through my roughest hours. But today, Max's meals come from this 3,000 square feet facility. In 1995, Food and Friends moved, allowing them to serve more than 1,000 clients a week. 
But as the organization expanded, the ravages of the disease decreased. One of the things that a lot of AIDS organizations are experiencing these days is the problem of raising money for aid services now that the bloom is off the rose, so to speak. Craig Snyderman replaced Reverend Gorell as executive director. Under his leadership, Food and Friends no longer anticipates closing its doors when a cure is found. Instead, they are now serving people with other debilitating diseases. We need to be mindful of the financial bottom line. Providing services to people with AIDS and non-AIDS related illnesses means there is a much larger donor community. Food and Friends gets referrals from local cancer centers and hospices. And since January 2000, they've added over 100 new clients. The new service helps them raise money. Is also attracting a substantial number of new donors who are not so AIDS interested, but indeed they're very interested in people with breast cancer, colon cancer, Alzheimer's. Are you Brenda? Yes. Here you go. Brenda Dudley is recovering from breast oh cancer. God. Under the new program, she gets a delivery every day. Brenda says the meals give her energy to run her shop with her life partner, Sharon. I'm here all day long from 8 in the morning to 9 at night, and I don't have time to cook at home. And, and the food is just it's, it's convenient, it's available, it's, it's a blessing. I can't, you know, say anything, but it's just it's heaven sent. In 1973, 15 years before Food and Friends was founded, another organization got its start in the basement of a church. The Whitman Walker Clinic was testing and treating gay men for sexually transmitted diseases a decade before anyone knew about AIDS. The irony of the AIDS epidemic, of course, is that it forced places like Whitman Walker Clinic to grow and to develop. And grow they did. While they still operate an anonymous STD clinic, Whitman Walker also encompasses several regional centers. In 1994, they opened the Max Robinson Center as a commitment to minorities and the poor. AIDS isn't over. The crisis isn't over. There's still a lot of need. And we need to continue to maintain our level of support in AIDS. Services are perhaps more necessary than ever, since patients are living longer. But since the demographics have changed, so has some donor interest. They don't see their loved ones dying when they don't see people struggling on the streets that they once used to see, when there aren't obituaries in the papers every week, it's not as hard to mo and not as easy to motivate people uh, to give in the same way. However, Whitman Walker is not cutting back on aid services, but instead is expanding its gay and lesbian services in such areas as fertility and adoption, breast and ovarian cancer, and teenage homelessness. We not only want to make sure that we are being responsive to the health needs of people with HIV, we want to be responsive to the health needs of gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people in this community that we serve. And its appeal to, don to, a, more, to a more generous donor base to turn our back on the real epidemic is certainly a compromise of our mission to end AIDS. As editor of Paws Magazine, Brad Peebles is concerned that public apathy is leaving AIDS organizations with little choice. I don't think we can judge them and say that it's right or wrong. I think they're responding to an environment um, to really real threat, which is that funding is on, is on a sort of downward slope. Um, so I admire their efforts to retool and reorient it. Uh, I worry about who gets left behind. Reverend Gorell worries whether the organization she founded will continue its commitment to people with AIDS. An organization needs to keep re-looking at its mission every time. And, and if it's focused on meeting a need, it's OK. But if it's focused on keeping itself going and is not in touch with community needs, then it's not OK. Personally, though, she can appreciate the new service. If my mother was ill and needed the kind of service that Food and Friends provides, a home-delivered meal, I would want her to have that because of the quality of the service and the food and the volunteers. As new treatments have developed, paradoxically, AIDS funding of all kinds has dwindled. Foundations, government, and the gay community now seem to be suffering from what is commonly known as AIDS fatigue. 
Along with the larger nationally known AIDS groups, there are hundreds of regional and local organizations, and many of these are the hardest hit. The Center for Disease Control provides links to many of these local organizations. Find a group in your area and find a way to support them. To learn more, go to the In the Life website at www.inthelifetv.org. This is Alex Sechel, and you're watching In the Life. The term political activist conjures up images of protesters taking to the streets or shutting down institutions, all in the name of change. Juanita Owens considers herself an activist. It's just that she wages her battle from within the system. Back when she was a teenager, Owens dropped out of high school because she was harassed for being a lesbian. 35 years later, after earning a doctorate in education and serving as president of the school board here in San Francisco, Owens is the consummate insider and she's using her position to challenge the status quo. In high school, I just, you know, was an awkward 15-year-old trying to deal with my sexuality. And I was referred to as a butch and not a femme. And that was my, that's how I identified. And that, at that time, was not acceptable. I mean, I had been threatened standing on the corner that I'm going to, you know, someone would come to me and say, I'm going to kick your ass. So school was not comfortable anymore. I wasn't involved in that, the politics of, my, of that time in my coming out. I found that to be a luxury. I couldn't afford that. I'm, I'm a woman with brown skin. I'm a woman of color. I'm a lesbian. Um, to be part of a major movement, I couldn't afford that. I had to think about survival. And I knew that there had to be more, and I wanted more. Uh, and that's why I decided to go back to school. In 1980, Owens received a master's degree in multicultural education. After teaching for many years, she pursued an assistant directorship at City College. I applied for a position. I was one of the finalists in, in administration for, uh, at City College, and I was removed. And why was I removed? And one of the questions was, is she a lesbian? Whether or not homophobia played a part in her contentious appointment to assistant director, the process pushed Owens to publicly acknowledge her sexual orientation. When I tried to move up and go into a higher position, I was challenged. And that's when um, my orientation, my sexual orientation became, became an issue. And that really opened the door and, and, and thrust me uh, out there. As an out lesbian, Dr. Owens served on a number of boards, including the police commission and as president of the Board of Education. We have not done a good job for our queer youth. We need to be at the table. We need to affect change in the curriculum, in the books that they read, and more gay, lesbian, um, bisexual, transgender people hired in positions, out people. That's very important, role models. There was something that I wanted to do that would be lasting, that would be remembered, and youth would take pride in, and, and people in San Francisco would, would be very proud of. And that's when I had envisioned creating a mural, but not just a mural that would go into an administrative office uh, or building, but a mural that would be in an educational setting, such as a high school. That mural shows it, from skaters to uh, musicians to artists to, uh, you know, politicians, and this just shows what, what uh, the gay and lesbian community has contributed to, you know, this, this country. And that's what it was all about, is to educate the young people and say, and, and, they happen to be, this happens to be a gay person, or this happens to be a lesbian, and this is the contribution, or you may not have even known it. It's the only mural of its kind, nationally, in a high school. It's phenomenal. <laughs> She's very funny, and people don't see that. And she has the most beautiful smile, and people say to you, I love your smile, but she doesn't show that. So people are afraid of her. You know, I'm not one that's usually speechless or anything like that. And, and as Linda says, I need to smile more and, and show that personal side of, of me that a lot of people don't get to see. She is an activist, and she's an intelligent activist. 
Um, she is the only lesbian with a chance, a real political chance, of being elected to the Board of Supervisors this year. Welcome to San Francisco Board of Education member and candidate for the Board of Supervisors, Dr. Juanita Owens. If I'm going to do it, now's the time to do it. And I knew that it was going to be difficult. Uh, I'm running in a very challenging district. Uh, I'm the only woman, uh, 10 guys. I have fought for safe streets, community policing, and leadership roles for women and people of color as a San Francisco police commissioner. She's planning to move to membership on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. She will arrive there, however, uh, frankly, not with the unanimous support of the gay and lesbian community. Of the two gay democratic clubs in San Francisco, only one gave Dr. Owens its endorsement. Her critics consider her willingness to compromise on certain issues a weakness. Someone had said to me once, you know, you need to stand firm on one position. You know, life's not black and white. There's a lot of grays. Yes, I can stand firm. It's a broader social issue. Human rights, civil rights, absolutely. Abortion, absolutely. Those things are they're not negotiable. But when we're dealing with factions, communities, then you need to start thinking about compromise. You, start, you need to start thinking about negotiation. She's moved from being just identified uh, as a lesbian politician into the mainstream. Her enthusiasm and her intelligence, uh, I think, makes her a good role model for young people. You see, that's what it's all about, education. I'm serious. Good for you. I feel like I'm constantly breaking a glass ceiling, constantly. And we don't have enough men or women of color, gays, lesbian, bisexual, transgender in the political arena. Today, in 39 states, gays and lesbians can be fired despite job performance with no legal recourse. This does happen, and it must be stopped. I look around, and there's been many times I'm it. And I shouldn't be. There should be more. Before 1977, there wasn't a single out gay or lesbian government official anywhere in the United States. Then Harvey Milk won a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and brought the issue of gay rights officially into America's political discourse. Today, we have over 150 out elected officials in various areas of government. The Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund is dedicated to keeping our community in the political conversation by endorsing qualified gay and lesbian candidates and raising money to support their campaigns. To learn more about the Victory Fund, go to the In the Life website at www.inthelifetv.org. I'm Peter Frechette, and you're watching In the Life. On this episode, In the Arts, Homocore, a night of gay rock and rap, returned this fall for its second season to the legendary New York nightclub, CBGB. I think that this particular venue has been really good for us, just because there's so many different bands performing, and everyone comes and watches all of them, that we've gotten a lot of new fans by playing at home. It's gave people an opportunity to really get together and like perform specific like gay acts. At the Kennedy Center in Washington. Irene Ferreira took to the stage with the sounds of Venezuela. I was born and raised in Venezuela, so my music has all that Caribbean influence. Uh, being right on the equator, I, I also think I 
Venezuelans, we are, we're pretty intense <laughs> people. So we have a lot to express, a lot to say. I believe in, in equal justice, I believe, you know, maybe because I'm a lesbian, also I'm very aware of um, the discrimination that goes on. In this country, I was able to be, just to be myself. So it's a, it was a very natural thing for me to come out. And finally, Academy Award-winning directors Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman were in New York to talk about Paragraph 175, their powerful new documentary about gays under the Third Reich. Paragraph 175 is the name of the section of the German penal code that outlawed homosexuality between, sexual acts between men and between men and animals. Um, and it dates back to the beginning of the German Republic in 1871. And it was revised and really put into use in a big way by the Nazis. Yeah, they stand in Verdacht, homosexual to sein. Und wie wenn sind hier hier mit verhaftet. Was sollte ich nun machen? Und dann gibt's ab nach der Hau. A couple things we were trying to accomplish. One was to actually give recognition to the men who wore the pink triangle. When I got the first time to the police, and they they asked me, "You are a homosexual man." And I said, yes, I am. Everybody knows it. I, I never said I'm, I'm not. Persecution did happen, and it was parallel to, but very different from what happened to the Jews, for example. It's been playing at film festivals all over the world and winning all kinds of awards. Paragraph 175, which won awards in Berlin and at Sundance, will be coming to theaters across the country. Still to come on In the Life. Shattering myths about sexuality and the mentally retarded. And gay filmmakers on how race and ethnicity color their work. You're completely invisible. There's no representation of like Indian Americans in, in film in America. But first, our next segment reminds us that long before the modern gay rights movement, there were courageous gay men and lesbians who refused to conform to accepted conventions. We look at the life and work of a woman who in her day was seen as a rebel and a renegade. Today, she is heralded as a revolutionary and role model. She lived from 1874 to 1970, and this is not only her portrait, but her work. In Paris in the early 1900s, Romaine Brooks, an expatriate American, was painting striking images of the women in her life. Some were lovers and some were friends, part of a circle of women who challenged accepted definitions of what it meant to be a woman, as well as the negative connotations of being homosexual. Brooks's contribution was to put a lasting face on her community. Now a comprehensive retrospective of her work and companion book are giving the gay community the opportunity to rediscover a revealing and extraordinary artist. Romaine Brooks is a really landmark figure in the development of gay art and gay lesbian consciousness because she was the first artist to really deal with lesbian life and personalities as her primary subject matter. Any woman at that period of time who would go out of her way by choice to paint lesbian subjects, bisexual subjects, uh, would have been extraordinary in any art historical context. The idea of a, of, of a kind of visible lesbian identity was really emerging for the first time within mainstream culture. This is an absolutely unique opportunity to see the work of Romaine Brooks. This exhibition is put together not only with the works from the Smithsonian American Museum of Art, but from seven museums, I believe, in France. A retrospective right now of her work is very important because there has been a real transformation in the way we understand 
pictures and artworks to operate historically so that a show now, as opposed to say 30 years ago, will focus not only on um, the artist's aesthetic achievement, but also will think about the way the images say particular things about people or about the culture that they were produced in. Romaine Brooks lived in the lesbian capital of the early 20th century. She was in Paris. She knew everybody who was anybody. And in Paris at that time, women, and especially lesbian women, really dominated the cultural scene. Uh, there were two rival salons, groups of people that gathered for cultural exchange and so forth. And one circled around Brooks and her lover, Natalie Barney, who was a writer. And the other circled around Gertrude Stein, and her lover, Alice Toklas. It was the first period and the first place where fairly openly gay people could have some kind of cultural life of their own and have a real impact. Her work focuses almost exclusively on women. And um, at the same time, there are several images that, I, that are distinctly about trying to visualize uh, a lesbian identity. Brooks's portrait of Una Trubridge is one that she actually referred to in a letter as a sign of the age to amuse some future feminists. She really was particularly interested in how these paintings reflected a certain idea about her contemporary culture. So that, for example, the short hair of uh, Una Trubridge is an incredibly fashionable way for women to bob their hair and also the sort of the I think deliberately emphasized um, made up lips and the, the very prominent pearl earrings all in some ways almost exaggerate a sense of femininity and then that's placed in contrast with the kind of severe tailoring and the very binding cravat. This image of Peter, a young English girl that um, has a real gentleness and sensitivity to the sitter's personality um, and a real quietness um, to the portrait itself that is somewhat, I think, at odds with what the contemporary audience would have seen as um, the somewhat shocking nature of the fact that she's wearing a man's suit. What's unique about Brooks is that any of the people that she was exhibiting for and selling to would have known perfectly well what these works were about because she made portraits of her lovers, she made portraits of well-known lesbian personalities, and sold them to those people and exhibited them as such. I do think that there was a segment of her viewership that would also have understood these as particular strategies that uh, lesbian women were adopting at that time to, in some ways, recognize one another in culture. This painting is, in some ways, the, the key image to her work, in particular because it's a self-portrait. It's very much about her creating a, a public identity for herself. I think her 1923 self-portrait is probably the lesbian icon you know, of the modernist period, so to speak, because it presents such a positive image, such a self-contained image, such a stylish image. I saw it as an extraordinary, forceful, compelling, cruisy portrait. With this more or less androgynous appearance, she's reflecting um, changes in um, you know, women's identity associated with the idea of the modern woman, a sort of early idea of female liberation. This is a painting called Spring from 1912, and it's also uh, one of the images for which Ayad Rubinstein, the Russian dancer, was the model. And it was painted while the two of them were involved in a personal relationship between 1911 and 1914. Most of her nude work that she did is centered around Ida Rubinstein. And I think Ida Rubinstein became a kind of physical ideal for her exploration of the female nude. There was a relatively concentrated period where she was thinking about the subject of the female nude. And what's interesting about it is that was still a fairly controversial subject for a female artist to paint. And she definitely did not back away from that controversy. 
this motif of the white azaleas is one that was specifically associated with Romain Brooks's work as an interior designer. So in a sense, what Romain Brooks has done is identify this space that this nude female figure is in as her own living space. And there, I think, she's definitely trying to force a recognition of this erotic connection between her as the artist and this female nude as the model. And this painting called The Crossing, in which, for all intents and purposes, Ida Rubinstein is shown as a dead woman. But she retains that sense of the almost icy eroticism of Ida Rubinstein's figure. There were certain limits on being a female artist at the turn of the century. And what she does is press those limits and change those limits. And I think, in part, her own personal sexuality is what uh, motivated her to really test those boundaries and to try to revise them. In the last 30 years, we've had a whole development of gay and lesbian cultural theory that lets us see what the connections might be between art and life. And in her case, uh, the connections are very powerful. The exhibition itself is a huge change. I mean, in the 80s, you couldn't do what has been done today in terms of talking about Romaine as a lesbian, putting up place cards with information saying, lesbian, lesbian, lesbian. The L word was just not to be used. Now it's out, and it gives us an opportunity to look at our history as gays and lesbians and bisexuals and to look at how people presented themselves, how their identities, as it were, were shaped and formed and matured. The idea of gay and lesbian identity has been somewhat erased from the historical record. The idea of, in a sense, rewriting history to include that um, is something that's important to a lot of scholars. So it is a very rare opportunity to see Romaine Brooks in her entirety and in this manner. The uh, exhibition will travel to the California Berkeley Museum of Art and after that it will go back to all of its owners. The most recent round of film festivals has turned up an especially interesting group of gay and lesbian themed movies by and about people of color. In the Life talked with the principals of two films about the role race and ethnicity played in the making, financing, and distribution of these features. Patrick Ian Polk's first film called Punks follows the escapades of a group of gay African American men in oh, West yeah. Hollywood. Lenny Kravitz? Mm. He makes me wet. The artist formerly known as Prince. Oh, do you remember the Inside Album jacket to 1999? Mmm, that photo with Prince laying in the bed, ass up, buck naked. I hadn't even hit puberty yet, but I was absolutely obsessed with that photo. I think that's when I first realized I was gay. The big thing that attracted me to the piece was that uh, the four guys in the film were men of color who were not killing each other. You know, it's like, yeah, I want to, I'd like to, I'd like to be a part of a film where, you know, we're actually shown loving each other, you know, that we do love each other and that we do care for each other and that we do try to take care of each other. Marcus, you are young, successful. You have all the time in the world and you waste it fantasizing about because and just because you're lonely, you expect me to sit at home with you on a Saturday night pulling taffy and watching videos. Well, I'm sorry, Sandra D. It ain't gonna happen. I ain't got that kind of time to waste. Hey, 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 bitch. I'm right there. What did you do? He's in his early 30s. He is HIV positive. He um, has the love of his life in his life who loves him in spite of the fact that he's HIV positive. He has good friends. We are family. I got all my sisters with me. 
playing the character gave me a chance to like go back to what I what I remembered about uh, about uh, what love could be, holding out for that kind of love. Why is it so hard for you to know how beautiful you are? No, no. You trust me, and sometimes I don't even trust myself. I thought, for the most part, it would be the first time in um, American cinema where we had an African-American character who was homosexual, who was also living and not dying it is with his black, HIV. Right? Oh, Marcus, come on. You bust your ass at the gym, then cover up all the results like a monk. Come on, man. You need to dress a little bit more openly. Be free. Free your mind, and your ass will follow. I feel that I've contributed to something that was, that is a breakthrough film. I know that it's the first of its kind. Most of the people who've seen it, they've had such a good time watching it. And, and it's, it's intriguing, it's fun, and it's beautiful to watch. Chutney Popcorn marks the feature debut of the winner of In the Life's 1997 short film and video contest. Nisha Ganatra directed, co-wrote, and stars in this charming story about a lesbian's attempt to win approval from her Indian American family. Baby, why do you make your life so much harder, huh? I want you to be happy, like Surya. Not I married mom, forget it. I want grandchildren. Are you too selfish to give me that? Mom, I'm a lesbian, I'm not sterile. Shh! Rina, you have no shame. When we finished the script, we decided to go to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, and meet with some companies and see if they would be interested in producing the film. We met with this one company who was like, we love the script, it's really funny, we just need you to change one little thing and then we could get it all going. Why don't you change all the Indian people to Italian people? And then um, they came back to us actually in a couple of days and said, well, they don't have to be Italian, they could be Jewish. There was one other company that was um, really interested and had all of the financing in place and was ready to shoot right away. And they just said, you know, we just have one little change for the rewrite and um, we'd like you to make both sisters straight. That idea of the least common denominator and let's, let's water things down so it appeals to as many people as possible. Um, I think it's insulting to audiences. You know, I think audiences are smarter than that. And, you know, what I found with this movie was the more specific I was and the more willing I was to put myself on the line and show a really specific experience, the more universal it was and the more people could relate to it. Dyke? Oh, Dyke. Total big old Dyke. Big old Dyke. Get it, she's straight. Gay and lesbian audiences, I think, were all ready for like, you know, a movie to move beyond the coming out story and not have the fact that this character's gay be the obstacle and be the central focus of the story. Dyke. Total Dyke. What'd you call her? Dyke. That's great. Why don't you just appropriate the culture of our oppressors? Is she Dyke? Is she Dyke? You know, this family happens to be Indian, you know, and, and that's not the obstacle or the main point of the film. And this one character happens to be gay, and that's not the obstacle. Like, no one has a problem with that. The problem is her sister can't have a baby, and she's going to have the baby for her sister, and everybody has a problem with that. What is this nonsense? Hey, you were just yelling at me about being selfish. Well, yeah, I mean, like, don't drink the last of the soda in the fridge or place the ice trays once in a while, not have a baby for your sister. You're just being used to perpetuate the heterosexual family model. Do I have to touch it? Nina and Lisa are exactly healthcare professionals. Christ, forget it. <laughs> you call Rina and you tell her to stop this nonsense. You know, everybody walks out of chatting popcorn and says, that mom was just like my mom, you know? Because it's not about being Indian or being lesbian or being of color or being oppressed. It's, you know, all of us have a mom that's a pain in the ass sometimes. <laughs> and 
all of us have, you know, the feeling of, of wanting approval. The idea of people only want to see things exactly like themselves. Uh, that sort of idea and that sort of thinking in Hollywood, I hope it's not true. And I hope we can prove that it isn't by having films that show something different be successful. On this episode's In the News, protesters gathered outside CBS for the September premiere of Dr. Laura Schlesinger's new television talk show. Laura Schlesinger is on record for calling gay people biological errors and deviants. Her bizarre and gross views about gay people are in direct opposition to the views of established medical and mental health professional organizations. As we went to deadline, Dr. Laura's new show was still on the air, but these protesters in New York, as well as those in dozens of other actions across the country, were hoping that Dr. Laura might be canceled by CBS. Welcome then to this very queer homily. <laughs> and in a different type of gathering, thousands of Christians assembled in DeKalb, Illinois, to address the concerns of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered persons. Many of us would never have assumed or believed that such a gathering could take place. It only can occur when men and women of faith stand up together, allowing us to be agents of justice and change in the communities that we inhabit. Our power comes from the very source which can overcome death and silence. So be the fire, sit in the fire, and share the flame. This welcoming movement will become a truly transformed and transforming movement where we care as passionately about eliminating racism, classism, and ableism as we do about caring, eliminating homophobia. With the support of dozens of churches, the four-day event included workshops, Bible study, and concerts. Hear what God says. Rise. Plead your case before mountains. I believe that in every other great movement for justice in the history of humanity, there has been a spiritual core that has moved it forward. Our final segment is from the In the Life archives. It's an eye-opening and rarely told story about a group of people coming to terms with their sexuality. After it first aired, inquiries poured in, and this past September, the Rainbow Support Group in Connecticut hosted a gathering of mentally retarded people from all over the country. This community is seldom thought of as sexual, much less sexually identified. But as Darius de Haas tells us, this impression is far from the truth. Once a month at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center in New Haven, Connecticut, a unique gathering takes place. The Rainbow Support Group provides a safe space to address the needs of a very specific segment of our society mentally retarded adults who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. For more than a year now, this group has provided affirmation and support to this minority within a minority. You gotta make sure you wear comfortable shoes if you walk. This group is possibly the first group of its kind in this country that is discussing what it means to be gay and have a disability. In the fall of 1998, John Allen founded the Rainbow Support Group in response to a need being voiced from within the human services field. The group is funded through the Easter Seals Goodwill Industries of New Haven, Connecticut. From all over the state, I was getting calls from agencies 
uh, saying that they had an individual that was gay or was lesbian or were cross-dresser, and could they bring that person down for a service? We started to realize that, hey, maybe there really is a need for this. It's just groundbreaking to hear mental retardation and sexuality discussed in the same context, and also uh, to take that one step further, to hear homosexuality discussed in, in that same context. You want to take your coat off and come sit down? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you tonight? Judy Tompkins is our founding facilitator. She just has a wonderful understanding so sister, of I, I what it means sister, to have mental retardation. She is heterosexual, but she's in a way like a Dr. Ruth, where she just has a wonderful understanding of sexuality and what is a natural part of being an adult. And she just has this great way of getting people to talk about what's going on inside of them. No. You just want us to find more women. <laughs> yes. You guys, don't you have any women friends that you get in the group? Developmental disability is a broad category that can include people who are mentally retarded. But developmental disabilities can also include autism, other kinds of severe learning disabilities. Person who is retarded means that their IQ falls below a certain point, which is actually the bottom two and a half percent of people tested. The number one thing all the group members say that they want is to meet other people, possibly have a relationship, have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or just to hang around with people who feel the same way they do. But other issues come up, staff not being supportive, sometimes people trying to change them, you know, trying to get the guys to date girls. It's hard to believe in this day and age that people don't know any better than that, but they don't seem to. The first portion of each Rainbow Support Group meeting is a time to reconnect when the members and their staff have a chance to catch up. Then, each individual speaks privately with the facilitator. Sometimes it's just personal issues. You know, sometimes people just have a hard time. They have a hard time at work. They have a hard time with their boss. They have a hard time with their housemate. You know, sometimes they just want to vent just like anybody else does. They always just want to kind of fit in. You know, they don't want anyone to think there's anything different about them, so they just want to be like everybody else. And I think part of being here is that they feel that way. Plus, they don't have to hide the whole sexual thing here. You know, they're just so relieved. Other people do this stuff, you know. It's like, they can hardly believe it sometimes. During its first year, a core group of participants from all over Connecticut was formed, unique individuals who have overcome many challenges in their lives. I want to Joe? Will. Oh, guys, uh, I come here every month. And Alan, identify oh, as gay. You help me learn to do better. To do better. Andrew is bisexual. Pam is currently the group's only lesbian. And Ben is a straight man who cross dresses. <laughs> the point is, it's not easy. It's not easy for her. And plus, it's not easy for me. Joe knew who he was when he walked in here. I mean, he was just like, oh, God, there's other people that are gay. I'm so glad to see you. And he just had no problem at all accepting it. He's who he is, and he knows who he is. It says, I feel, I feel fine about this. I don't have a problem with it at all. My sister, she said, if you don't have a problem with it, she said, that's, that's OK, too, she said. So she knows you're gay. You know how she is, Adrian. You met her. Adrian Whoa. is Joe's direct care support staff. Mondays are her day off, and she, on her own time, will bring Joe down to the group. That is dedication. I hope that Joe would find someone. I really do. I would love to see him um, come to this group and meet someone that he's interested in and, of course, pursue um, a friendship first and, then of course, relationship if that happens. I thought there would be more women. <laughs> we all thought there would be more women. When I first met Pam, uh, literally within the first sentence of our introducing ourselves, um, she came right to me and said, you know, I'm Pam, I'm gay, and can you help me find a partner? I would describe Pam as uh, a quietly surprising person. She, she may appear to be shy, but she's bold in some other areas of her life. Yeah, guess what? I 
just got on the internet. <laughs> you did? I did. I did. Okay. 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 Oh, well, you on the internet. Huh? Seems as though she was like a little dam that was held back for a number of years, and suddenly with the right environment, the right supports, and, and particularly this, this group, the floodgates are opened, and she's shooting off. <laughs> I enjoy it more. Ben more is an individual that I think has had one of the most difficult times in trying to get to this point. He was in a horrible living situation where his support staff were trying to force him to conform to what they felt was right for him rather than listening to Ben. Because of the cross-dressing, it's been a different kind of situation with Ben that he had a little bit of trouble trying to relate to the other people in the group. But I think that he started to realize that it's all kind of the same thing, and he feels more comfortable. One of the things that was really exciting was at our recent holiday party here at the center, we were able to uh, provide some introductions for him to connect with, with the support group for cross-dressing, and then made some instant new friends. What did that feel like for you then, to see that? It feels like, well, if he could do it, I could do it. They feel that there is no one out there that really truly understands what's going on inside of them. And so that is really one of the, the biggest things that this group has been able to do, is to break down that sense of isolation that people feel. You didn't see that over there in that corner over there? I didn't no. see I, I saw that. I think I saw that. People with handicaps aren't allowed to have normal sexuality. They have no sexual outlets, and we kind of create problems for them, and they get themselves in trouble because they have no way of expressing their sexuality at any level. But if they could come here and see other people who were gay, who had normal lives, and were comfortable with who they were, that they could kind of grow from that and feel supported. From all of us at In the Life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Leppin, Peter Zimmer and Jim Stepp, the Arch and Bruce Brown Foundation, the Collingwood Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice. The Gay Network. Gay.com and the annual support of In the Life members like you.